And then I wrote that one back in 1989. And it connected me to a baseball legend. And so I'm quite proud of that. The only mistake I made was I didn't put my name on it. So nobody knows that I wrote it, but believe me, I did. And that was back in back in the 80s, believe it or not. That's you know, for some people that's a long time ago. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna open up with a poem today that's called The Giants. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna circle around and I'm gonna tell you what I was thinking about when I was writing that poem. And it goes something like this. Uh, giants, they come fast, they come slow, and disappear like the last light of the sun in segregated America, and all we see is their glory. But we'll be lonely there when people have forgotten and there's no one left to share. After all, none of us are happy these brothers were treated so unfair. You see, some giants played for fame. They were athletes in a baseball game who tore their rotator cuffs and came up throwing. Some of them were down, some of them were crowned, others lost and never found. But most have seen it all. They spent their lives on touring buses or crowded cars, barnstorming for glory when no one was there to tell their story. Some giants, or let me put it this way, in a town, the name Drew, few can recall, one of these giants really slugged the ball. He had five hits, scored three runs, bases stolen four. I'd like to know where, I'd like to know more, but there was no one there to record this game. And for added shame, the newspapers didn't bother to record his name. Some giants made it when they were young, they played the game for fun in a world that was never ready to accept them. I see it was a dirty job for those who paved the way for every time they lift their eyes and tried to soar, they had to wonder who would be there to bar the door. Some giants had arms of steel, men would play to see, so they put it on display. Some had great speed, even I could watch them run all day. Some excelled at hitting ball with bat, and gee, their hitting was advanced. Young boys said, I could do that if I had half the chance. I could be a giant. Like bronze men of age 25, young and alive, crowds watching them as they walked and laughed, then asked for memorabilia and autographs in small towns, and big cities too, people filled the stands and gave their approval with feet and hands while watching them play with ball and glove as young girls marveled at their physique and dreamed of kissing them on the cheek. Yet these men never could believe you truly loved them. Some giants made it when they were old, after age 40, still playing tricks on father time, throwing baseballs over dimes using a talent they still could share, a deep down soul they had to bear. Or maybe it wasn't much there. Or even they would say, I didn't have much then, but when I was young, you wouldn't let me in. For surely the wise knew one day, or that day would come when someone would say, 20 years ago, you were one tough cookie, but now you must move over for rookies. But will we ever know the pain of living with a nickname you never owned? Who pop, turkey, double duty, a buck, a nickname on loan that somehow stuck, or the many years of beginning, the only job you've ever known, life on the road, living away from home, or being the showcase. Or oh, I could make a case to show these men were never paid the money their gift, gift was owed. These were men with names that will live beyond this day, men who played for the love of the game, regardless of the pain. So when you think of baseball, remember these old men, scorned and despised, the original giants, the unrecognized, the giants who came fast, who came slow, then disappeared like the last light of the sun in segregated America. And today, we're gonna to learn a little bit about their story. Thank you. So my first slide, I was thinking about and reminiscing about a guy by the name of Chet Brewer. Most of you probably have never heard of Chet Brewer, but he was a Kansan. He was born in Leavenworth, Kansas, 1900. And when he was four years old, his foot was par partially decapitated by a trolley car. So he lost three toes on his foot. And so as the years passed, Chet Brewer, Brewer, well, let me put it this way, some black doctors in Leavenworth saved his leg. They were going to amputate. They saved his leg. And so years later, he became a great pitcher with the Kansas City Monarchs. He also pitched for a team called Brown's Tennessee Rats, if you can imagine that. 
And uh, after he retired, after a 30 some odd year career, he moved to Los Angeles. And that's where I caught up with Chet Brewer in Los Angeles. And the first time I went to Los Angeles, 1985, I stayed at Chet Brewer's house. And he began to tell me about all the baseball players that he had on teams when he was coaching after his career ended. And it just so happens that one of those players, Reggie Smith, was the first baseball player, professional player I ever met. I met him in Kansas City, he was playing for the Red Sox. It was a weird story. But then he began to tell me about the other players. And you probably, you've heard of a few. You, I don't know if there's baseball fans here remember Roy White, played for the Yankees, or Bobby Tolan, played for the Cincinnati Reds. Um, he had a guy named Bob Watson, he was with, uh, he scored baseball's one millionth run. Um, and uh, he became the general manager of the New York Yankees, knew him very well. And then he had the infamous Doc Ellis. You probably heard of infamous. If you don't know what I mean by inf infamous, go pick up a baseball book. It'll make sense later on. And uh, how about this? His bad boy was a guy named Eddie Murray, who's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And that was Chet Brewer. So I got out to Chet Brewer's house. I'm spending the night at his house. So what do you think I asked Mr. Brewer? I said, Chet, let me see the foot. <laughs> so I can say I'm probably one of the few people who saw Chet Brewer's foot without the toes. He said, well, why would you want to see somebody's foot without the toes? Well, when I was growing up, there was a pitcher by the name of Catfish Hunter. Pitcher of the Kansas City area. He was missing toes, too. And I grew up with that kind of baseball lore, so to actually be where somebody who had done all these successful things didn't have all their toes, I had to see it. So <laughs> that's the kind of baseball, I'm really inquisitive about how I approach the game. And you probably heard of this team, the Kansas City Monarchs. And uh, this is a picture, they were established in uh, 1920. This is gonna be important, you'll catch that in a minute. But you know, the first time they came to Kansas, actually Wichita, Kansas, was in 19, what I had, 23? and they played the Monrovians. Monrovians was a local black team here, and there were some players who came from the Monrovians who ended up playing with the Monarchs. But if you look online, there's this great story about the Monrovians playing a game in 1925 against the Ku Klux Klan right here in Wichita. So this is all baseball history. You can look that up, it's out there. But that's who they played the first time. And then I thought about people who came from here. And this gentleman right here that's bad, his name was Hallie Harden. Hallie Harden was a professional baseball player. He was also a professional football player. And in addition to that, guys, uh, I've written several things on boxing, and he uh, covered boxing out in Los Angeles to the day he died. But he was born in Wichita, and most people have never heard of Hallie Harden. So Wichita, Hallie Harden. Another great name, so I like to touch on those. Then I was thinking about guys who tore their rotator cuff and came up throwing, and I had to think about Carol Ray Mopper. First time I met him was in 1980 in Topeka, Kansas. And I had been a young kid who collected baseball cards and things like that, and I read all kind of books, but I had never heard the stories he was telling me about the Negro Leagues. And he played in Negro Leagues from 1920 to 1934 till he hurt his arm, rotator cuff. He retired and went back home to Topeka. I meet him in 1980, and a week later he died. But he told the lady who was the nurse taking care of him, he said, when this guy comes back, give him these photographs. And those photographs became the first photographs that created the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. So when you think of the museum in Kansas City, they won't ever mention Mopple's name. Uh, and I'm a co-founder, they already mentioned mine, so you know they're gonna mention Mopple. <laughs> so, but he was one of the people who's responsible for that museum. Interesting thing in that, that those items she gave me, there was a passport from when he had played baseball in the Philippines in 1932. And in that passport, it had his date of birth. Now remember, I only saw I mean, actually, this guy died maybe a week, two weeks after I met him, and he said, give these guys, this, this guy the photographs. Well, his birthday was August 13th. And guess what my birthday is? <laughs> August 13th. <laughs> I thought that's a coincidence, but a few years later in uh, 1980, my wife's not here, it's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> 1984, I got married. And guess what my wife's birthday is? 
August the 13th. <laughs> so that's an important day. But Mr. Marco is what, who I was thinking about as I was writing that portion. And then also, I was thinking about some of them are crowned and some of them are down. But anyway, I was thinking about my first baseball coach. Now, the first time I played baseball, I played for several years. All I had was a blue hat similar to this, a white t-shirt, a pair of jeans, right? And a baseball glove. And the bat was supplied by the team. And so that's how I played ball. But the first time I put on a uniform, I put it on for this guy, and his name was Sherman Jones. And he had pitched uh, for the New York Mets, also the uh, San, Fr uh, uh, San Francisco Giants, right? And so he liked to tell baseball stories, and I liked to listen to them. And so I just happened to know a little bit about baseball because I collected baseball cards, so I knew some of these players. And he told me the story about Ed Cranepool. He said Ed Cranepool was on the team. Of course, Casey Stingle was the manager of the Mets, and the Mets were one of baseball's worst teams. Uh, so he would tell the story. He said Ed, Ed Cranepool hit a triple. Runs around the base, goes into third base, standing up with a triple. But the other team noticed that he missed second base, so they made an appeal. They threw the ball over to second base. They stepped on second base. The umpire said, you're out. You missed second base. And Ed was so upset that he argued for five minutes, kicking up dirt, throwing his hat on the ground. He was just angry as can be. And so finally, the manager, Casey Stingle, gets tired. And he's, you know, he used to sleep on the bench, by the way. <laughs> so he gets up, and he goes out to get Ed. He says, Ed, you need to go sit down, because you missed first base, too. <laughs> <laughs> So those are some of the stories that I got from Sherman Roadblock Jones, my first coach. In addition to that, I collected baseball cards, but I started off in 1964 with actually Beatles cards. And I made the mistake as a second grader of taking those cards to school, and the teacher said, these aren't collectibles. She looked at them as toys, and she took my Beatles cards. I know, I did have got them back at the end of the school year. But when I went back to the store, I was going to buy some more Beatles cards, but they're sold out. The only thing left was baseball cards. So I picked up a pack of baseball cards and kept picking up pack after pack. By the time I was 19 years old, I had over 100,000 baseball cards. And I learned a lot off of those baseball cards. I learned everything from towns and states, geography. I even learned how to speak a little Spanish. Uh, there was a, I was, uh, had a card and it was a, uh, a ball player who played for, um, he played for San Francisco at that time. And uh, his name was, what I thought was Jesus I knew. <laughs> Until I was watching the game of the week and they said, hey, Zeus I knew. I said, oh, that means, this must be how you feel, hey, Zeus, in Spanish. <laughs> Nobody was directing me, so you just pick up things as you went. And that's how I learned. So. But I had a lot of baseball cards. I had cards from the, even though I started in 64, by the time I was 19, I had cards and sets that were complete from 61. I had the 55, 56 tops. I had uh, the Life of Ted Williams in 1959. I had all these Fleer sets, the old timer sets. And people would say, you know, how did you get all these cards? Well, I did have one trick. Whenever teenage boys in my neighborhood found out about girls, I got the cards. <laughs> That's how I built my collection. You know you love your collection when you start taking pictures with them, right? And guys, I did have a little more hair back then. <laughs> Been a few years, but that was kind of how I got my start. And then how I got my start in books was because of Babe Ruth. And I was thinking about him as I was writing this poem and how he came into my life. And our reader, there was a story about Babe Ruth. They said he had 714 major league home runs, and uh, they, they talked about his batting average, but if you had told me a 300 batting average was good, I wouldn't have known the difference, right? Uh, I didn't know 714 home runs was that good. And then they said he struck out 2,000 times. Didn't know if that was good or bad. But then they said that he ate 21 hot dogs between the double header. <laughs> I didn't even know what a double header was, but I knew a 21 hot dog. And just like that, I became a Bay Ruth fan for the rest of my life. And he's in my presentation now. Uh, Bay Ruth, 1927, 
Uh, Babe Ruth made over $200,000 with endorsements and everything that he was working on, being paid salary. And someone came to Babe and they said, Babe, do you know you had, you made more money than the President of the United States? And Babe Ruth said, why not? I had a better year. <laughs> <laughs> and then I talk about how they traveled, you know, that's part of my point, you know, um, crowded cars and tour buses. And I started to think about a couple of people. Well, before I came down today, I stopped at Maple Grove Cemetery. Somebody knows what it is, right? Well, you have a black Olympian buried there. And his name is Saul White. Saul Butler, excuse me, Saul Butler. And so I went over today and went to the cemetery and I was able to put flowers over at Saul's Butler's grave. Interesting thing, uh, he was also a professional football player. And you know, they talk about black quarterbacks now. How about he was a black quarterback in the NFL in 1925. And this guy is buried right here in Wichita. You can look him up and you can see this great story about Saul Butler. So I was thinking about him. Then also, uh, I was thinking about uh, a book I wrote about John Buckle Neal. I did put some books on the table. You can kind of see some of the stuff I've written over the years. And he told me how uh, before he got to the Kansas City Monarchs, he was with some teams that, yeah, you know, we'll say they weren't capitalized very well. And so sometimes the car would break down or uh, the vehicles they had, they didn't have a bus, mostly cars. And he told me about a story he had to hobo from a couple of these towns to get to the Wichita tournament. That kind of deal, or coming from Wichita. Uh, and so anyway, long story short, uh, I decided to illustrate a point when I'm writing my book and when I come out to speak. So since I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, right by the railroad tracks down in the Fairfax district, you know, we used to hop trains for, uh, for recreation. I hate to say that when young kids are in the room. <laughs> don't do that. I always have, don't do that. <laughs> but we did. And uh, so I thought I'd go down to the rail yard and. Now, I have to tell you, that train's not moving. Things, times have changed. We don't mess with moving trains anymore. And uh, so I took a picture, and um, that is me down there to illustrate a point that sometimes they had to, what we call hobo, to get to the game. And Buck O'Neill went into the Hall of Fame last year, was one of those people who hoboed out of Wichita riding the train. And then some of the people I met, there was a gentleman by the name of James Coop Papa Bale. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Well, let me tell you this story. The first time I heard this phrase, it was Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali said that he was so fast you could, he could turn out the lights and get in the bed before the room got dark. <laughs> and, and I heard that, right? But now that I've studied baseball, I realized that Muhammad Ali really stole that from Satchel Page, who said that about James Kupaka Bell. Said he was so fast he could turn the lights out and get in the bed before the room got dark. And uh, Kupaka even told me the story how it came about. So, uh, and then Satchel Page, since he told that story, now Satchel Page had a quote. He said, age is mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. But he stole that. <laughs> so you dig a little deeper, you'll find out that was Mark Twain. And a gentleman right there, he showed me that quote today. Yep, he's got a patch. He showed me, I said, I gotta put that back in my program today. So that's Satchel Page. So be careful where you get your quotes from. That's also like he said. So this is Coop Papa Bell. Coop Papa Bell told me that in 1933 he stole 175 bases in the season, but only got credit for 91 because the guy kept forgetting the scorebook. So I was young at that time. I coached baseball for a number of years. And I, and I kind of said, can a guy really steal 175 bases in a season? Because you know, it never happened in the major leagues. Well, about 1984, a guy named Vince Coleman comes along and in the minor league season, still 145. So I said, man, it's possible. And I remember talking to Coupac and Bell about it. But then in 2012, there was a guy, he just retired last year from the Minnesota Twins. His name was Billy Hamilton. And he stole 155 bases <clears throat> in 2012. But most people haven't followed that. So they don't know some of these great baseball players are still among us. And he just retired last year. So that was cool Papa Bell. And I had a chance of meeting him. And you can see me there with him, um, a much younger me. 
and a much older group I was in. And then when I was talking about some guys made it when they were young and played the game for fun, I was thinking about a guy out of Manhattan, Kansas, by the name of George Giles. <clears throat> the first time I went to visit George Giles, it was about 1982. And I took my girlfriend, who is now my wife for 39 years, uh, down, and she went with me. We were like interviews, and she's just riding along. And we got to George Giles' place. He had a bar there, and he wouldn't let her in his bar. And as I said, it's the middle of the day, nobody's here. He said, I've never let women in my bar. So I said, why is that? He said, well, I've been open for over 40 years. I've never had one fight in my bar. He said, whenever I let the women in, the guys show off and I have to break up fights. <laughs> so he wouldn't let her in, so she never got to see the inside of his bar. But uh, that was George Giles. And when I was thinking about him, he came to the Kansas City Monarchs at 16 years old. But I was reading about other people who came even earlier. You probably heard of Willie Mays. He played with the grown men on the Chattanooga Black Lookouts when he was 14. Or if you remember Roy Campanella? Campanella came to the Negro Leagues at age 15. So he didn't get to the Dodgers until a number of years later. But he had already been playing in the Negro Leagues professionally since 15 years old. So I was thinking about these guys. Most people don't know these stories, so I like to tell them. Then I was also thinking about this guy. Uh, his name was Josh Gibson. They called him the Black Bay Ruth. So you know he had a lot of home runs, right? And so anyway, uh, the story I always like to tell about Josh Gibson was uh, one of the Kansas City Monarch players said when they were playing the Graves, he went to the Graves' bat rack and he found an old broken bat that had been uh, thumbtacks put in it and taped up and things like that. So he, he picked up the bat and he went to Josh and said, Josh, this must be your old broken bat. And Josh Gibson said, I don't break bats, I wear them out. And that was Josh Gibson, a great home run hitter. They say he hit over 900 home runs before he died, and he died at age 38. Then I think about some of the great promoters, uh, and most people don't know this. How about this? When the Kansas City Monarchs organized in 1920, they were charter members of the Negro National League. And you know, all the players in the league were black. All the owners were black, except for two men. And those two men owned the Kansas City Monarchs. One of them was J.L. Wilkinson uh, from Algona, Iowa, originally. The other one was Tom Baird, originally from Pendle, Pinnacle, Arkansas. He lived in Kansas City, Kansas, where I grew up. So those, those were your owners of the Kansas City Monarchs. Most people don't know they were owned by two white gentlemen. Uh, J.L. Wilkinson is quite interesting in that, how about he believed in gender relations. He believed originally his first baseball team he organized around 1907, 1908, was called the Bloomer Girls. And he had girls playing hardball baseball. And he had three guys that dressed up like women who did the pitching. Now don't ask me where they went to use the restroom. <laughs> That's a political statement. But that was uh, J.L. Wilkinson. And then he started tinkering around with a thing called night baseball. And by 1930, the Kansas City Monarchs were playing night baseball. Now, the fact, the first night baseball game ever played in Wichita was played with his portable lights that he put together on four trucks, and they had a big generator, and they played here in 1930. But uh, the president of the American League, his name was Van Johnson. And Van Johnson said that night baseball will never last. It's just a passing thing. <laughs> baseball should be played in the daytime. And J.L. Wilkinson said that lights will be the baseball where talkies are the movies, and the movies had just started talking in 1927 with Al Josephs, the jazz scene. So we know who was right on that, right? And that was J.L. Wilkinson. Most people don't know that he's a member of the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame right now. You can go to Cooperstown and see his play. Then also there was Tom Baird. Tom Baird lived in my hometown. And in 1922, now remember the Monarchs were organized in 1920. So in 1922, uh, the Ku Klux Klan had started to infiltrate the state of Kansas. So the governor wanted to know how much had they come into the state. So he put people under, kind of like under security. And uh, so they would go out like they were members and they would sign up and they would make lists of 
who was in the meeting and, and who was members. They get the membership list and, and then they turn it into the governor of Kansas. And those records are in Washington, D.C., by, by the way. So when it came to Kansas City, Kansas, my hometown, not only was the mayor a member of the Ku Klux Klan and all the city council, but guess who else was? Tom Bear was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, you know, his uh, daughter, uh, later on, Harriet Wickstrom was her name. And I don't think Harriet was always in agreement with her dad because Harriet became one of my biggest backers and um, to the day she died. And so if you ever go to Lawrence, Kansas, in the Spencer Library, there's a collection of Tom Bear's memorabilia. It was in her basement when I met her and we talked. And so we came to an agreement. I, I heard that they were collecting this, this, uh, these artifacts. And so she sent it to Lawrence, Kansas. So his entire collection is there. And that's because of Harriet Wickstrom. And you won't see Harriet's name much in much anywhere else. And you certainly won't see my name in connection with it. But I had a role to play in. But Harriet Wickstrom, is a, she was a great lady. So anyway, that was somebody I met. Then also, the one I have in the middle was a guy by the name of Ray L. Dome. Ray L. Dome was a great promoter out of Muscatine, Iowa. And uh, he was famous for a type of baseball that he invented called donkey baseball. And uh, 1934, Dizzy Dean played here. I wrote about that in my Dizzy Dean book. He played in Wichita here. And after the game, they had a game of donkey baseball. As many people stayed around to watch the donkey baseball, they did to watch Dizzy Dean. So, but that was uh, Ray L. Dome out of Muscatine, Iowa, a great promoter. Then, of course, there were African-American promoters. There's Ray Ruth Foster there uh, with the American Giants. I spoke last week at a, a church, and uh, so I had a chance to tell them that he was a United Methodist, uh, Ruth Foster was, and C.I. Taylor was AME. So you, you learn all these things when you start doing history, right? And then there are a couple of... Uh, uh, black newspaper uh, writers, one from the Indianapolis Freeman, which I use quite a bit. <clears throat> but there are also black newspapers in Kansas. And anybody know the, the uh, Wichita black newspaper? The Voice. The Voice. Uh, it's called, well, that might be now, but back then they had the Negro Star. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, way back. <laughs> and then also there was one out of Topeka called the Plain Dealer. Topeka Plain Dealer, which ended up in my hometown as the Kansas City, Kansas Plain Dealer after the owner died in Topeka. And then Ray L. Dome, I mentioned, he was a great promoter, but he was also the road manager and the promoter for the House of David. And I don't know how much you know about the House of David, but the House of David, uh, this, is, this is the House of David here. And I try to tell young kids or teenagers, these weren't hippies from the 1960s. <clears throat> this was a baseball team, and they belonged to a religious cult out of Benton Harbor, Michigan. And uh, there's a great documentary out, as, and I'm in that documentary. You can't miss me. I'm the only black guy in it, so you can't miss me. <laughs> and uh, it came out uh, last year, 2022, and it won a Cannes Film Festival Award. Never thought I'd be anything that had a Cannes Film Festival Award, but I'm in that. And uh, when I went to Benton Harbor, someone recognized me from the documentary who was at the old colony. And so they took me all around and showed me places that you would never get a chance to go. And so I would never write about the House of David the way I did because now my knowledge is just, you know, it's, it's, it's tremendous and, you know, compared to what it was. But the House of David, um, if you joined up with the colony and you were married, uh, they practiced celibacy, so you couldn't have any more children. Uh, couldn't have sex with your wife. And um, they also were vegetarians. I mean, and they preached that, they, you know, they were going to be the 14,000 people that were going to serve with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. There's still some religion teaching that today. And their leader was Benjamin Parnell. And Benjamin said, if you join us in the house of David, you will never die. Of course, he died in 1927. <laughs> But they did not bury him. They put his body in a glass sarcophagus inside the Diamond House. And Diamond House is fully restored. It's beautiful if you ever get a chance to go there. And uh, I didn't get a chance to go in there. They didn't take me that far in. But I did see some pictures of some people who refurbished the house. 
and they took some pictures. Of so he's still there, and they've had a couple of people come in, they clean him up every so often. So they did not bury him, but his wife was Mary Parnell, and I did get a chance to go to her mausoleum there. And so, uh, very interesting. The House of David, they created a couple of things that you probably know about. Um, anybody ever go bowl here? Anybody, any bowlers here? Well, they created the automatic pin stacker through their religion. Uh, they also uh, invented, they don't get credit for it, they were at the 1903 St. Louis World's Fair, and they were there with their ice cream because they were great pioneers in frozen foods and ice cream. And they invented the waffle cone. So if you're, next time you get a waffle cone, make sure there's no hair in there. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the house of David, a great, uh, great major league. And they weren't major league, but they were major league. They really had some great players that played with the house of David. And so the house of David, they played many games against the Kansas City Monarchs. And Tom Barrett had a little bit in their promoting. Of course, Rio Dome was with them all the time. And they did play here in Wichita. As you can see here, 1931, uh, the first time they came through Wichita that I know of. Okay, but I think they were here in 25 also, but uh, that was them. And they came through and they played night baseball using the same lights the Kansas City Monarchs had the year before. So House of David. But they also had a couple other things they did in 1931. They signed up a guy by the name of Grover Cleveland Alexander. He still holds the major league record or the national league record for 90 shutouts in a season. He won over 300, actually 373 Major League Baseball games. And so they signed him and he was retired. So he would come out, pitch one inning, and then he would go and sit down for the rest of the night. And you see, I have one thing here said, uh, the town was seething with anger when Alex failed to show, uh, but Clarence Mitchell, which was another guy who used to pitch in the big leagues, he pitched for both sides and beat himself two to one. <laughs> but, but there was a reason Grover Cleveland couldn't always come out and pitch, Grover Cleveland Alexander. We'll just say this, he was known to take a nip. Somebody knows what that means? So he wasn't always up to pitching. And then they also had a young, well, let me say this, Grover Cleveland Alexander, he's named after a what? And she pitched here, and uh, she would come out. Her name was Babe Dickerson. Babe Dickerson uh, won Olympic gold medal, medal medals. Uh, she was, uh, she's in our golf hall of fame. She was a professional basketball player. Just, a, just an all around athlete. She even married a wrestler later on, uh, Zaharias. That's why I think I have her name, Zaharias. So, um, See, what can I tell you about Babe? Well, I'll tell you what. She was making $1,000 a month playing for the House of David in 1932 during the Depression. That was unheard of. So most people and a lot of young people, they don't know about Babe Dickerson. So these are people we need to share and let them know. And she does have a museum in, uh, in Texas, is her where museum is. But it's just, she was just a great a player. And she, her best pitch was a spitball. And uh, Burton Grimes, the last person who could legally throw the spitball in Major League Baseball, saw her spitball and he said, hers is better than mine. Can you imagine a lady having a better spitball than the guy? And then at the point I talked about some people, um, you know, uh, making it when they were old. And then of course, I was thinking about some of these guys, and, and Satchel Page comes to mind, but then I begin to think about guys who never lived to be old. 
And some of them were my favorite players. One of them was uh, Bill Lindsey. Bill Lindsey was out of Lexington, Missouri. I spoke there last Juneteenth. Uh, Bill Lindsey died from uh, tuberculosis. And he was only 24. He pitched eight years, and he was only 24. And he was a sensational pitcher. And then, of course, uh, what the other one I mentioned, uh, Bill Monroe. Bill Monroe was a pallbearer at Bill Lindsay's funeral, and he died the next year from tuberculosis. And uh, Henry Milton, pitcher, he played for the Kansas City Monarchs, played here many times. He was Buck's teammate and uh, Buck O'Neill's teammate in 1938. They were good friends. He died from spinal meningitis. And he was a track star. He was one eighth of a second off the world's record. But he played baseball instead of running track. And of course, when I was growing up, there was a guy named Don Wilson, pitched by the Houston Astros. He was one of Chet Brewer's players. And uh, he, he died from carbon monoxide in his garage, him and his son. I remember that story growing up as well. So these are all people who didn't live long, but there were some other ones who did. And you remember this guy, remember this guy, Satchel Page? Now he holds a record down here. He pitched in the first uh, National Baseball Congress tournament back in 1935. Still holds the record for the most uh, strikeouts in a, in a tournament. Still holds that record to this very day. And that was Satchel Page. A lot of stories I can tell you about Satchel Page. I told you how I wrote the, uh, the, the uh, description on the back of his monument. But you know, Satchel Page was such a celebrity, he didn't have to ride on the bus with the rest of the team. He could drive his own car. And, and he had two Cadillacs. He had a pink one and he had a black one. And sometimes I mention the pink Cadillac, people kind of snicker a little bit. But I always have to tell them, Elvis Presley had a pink Cadillac too. Guys do not want that pink Cadillac anymore because of Mary Kay. <laughs> Different day. But back then it was pretty hot idol. And so Satchel Page, the story says, he was speeding to a small town and uh, the sheriff pulled him over because he was, he was speeding. And he said, well, speeding through our community, he said, uh, I can give you a ticket and you can come back or we can go up to the courthouse and you can pay it right now. Satchel said, let's go to the courthouse. So they get up to the courthouse, the judge looks over the case. He says, speeding through our community, that's gonna cost you $25. Satcher said, your honor, I'm gonna give you $50. And the judge said, what is this for? He said, I'll be coming back through this evening. <laughs> that was Satchel Page, a great American baseball hero. And uh, he, is, he owes the distinction of being the oldest rookie in Major League Baseball history, 42 years old. And the only way that you could beat a record like that is to become the oldest player to ever pitch. So in 1965, he pitched three innings for the Kansas City Athletics. And uh, he gave up one hit, a double to Carl Yastrzemski, and then he uh, struck out one batter, the pitcher, Bill Mumble Kid. And you can tell I collected baseball cards, that's how I know all those names. <laughs> so anyway, that was Satchel Page. Then I was thinking about nicknames. And uh, in the, you know, well, okay, we probably got some Kansas City Royals fans here, right? So uh, the catcher for the Royals, Salvador Perez, what's his nickname? Salvador. Salvador. What kind of nickname is that? In the old days, you got colorful nicknames. And usually it was a couple of veteran guys who would sit on the bench, and they watched the young guys come in, and they watched how you ate, they could see how you dressed, they knew where you were from, they listened to you talk, they watched you eat, and that's how you got your nickname. And this guy right here, he was trying out for the Montgomery Gray Sox. He was running down balls in the outfield. And a cool veteran guy was sitting on the bench and one of them said, look at that guy running with his chest stuck down. And the other guy said, yeah, he looks like a turkey. He said, that's a good name right there. And he became Turkey Stearns. And just like that, guys, He's in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame today and on his plaque it says Norman Turkey Stars. That's how you got your nickname in the old days. And all the good players had really good names. And if you, even if you were like a, just a moderate baseball fan, you know names like this. So if I was to say Mickey, what would, what would you say? And if I, of course, we say Babe, you already know that one, right? And if I was to say um, Shooters, you know, Joe Jackson, and um, see what I was going to say. How about this? If I was to say Pee Wee, what would you say? 
Read. I was uh, in Zanesville, Ohio. There was a 90-year-old lady who came to see me twice. I was at a lunch and she followed me over at a night event too. And so when I, um, I didn't say this in the first session, the session, the second session, I asked this question. I said, Peewee, and she blurted out Herman. <laughs> I was picking a young person, not a 90-year-old lady. <laughs> so anyway, we have fun with baseball, right? And you know, growing up, I didn't realize that some of these nicknames are ethnic. A lot of people don't realize that. And some nicknames, black players will never have. So, for instance, um, you'll never see a black player nicknamed Dutch. Growing up, I knew a lot of ball players named Dutch. How about Swede? Swede McDougal, that was one that we grew up with, knowing that he got kicked out with the Black Sox scandal in 1919. But I grew up with a lot of ball players named Whitey. Whitey Ford, uh, Whitey Herzog, Whitey Lockman. You'll never see a black guy with that name. <laughs> But that's how nicknames come about. They look at you and what you do, and they look at you, and that's how you got your nickname in the old days. That's a lost art now. I'd like to see it come back so, so we can enjoy baseball all the way through and through. And I was down in Oklahoma. Uh, this was uh, in January of this year. And I was speaking, and I showed this slide. And there was an 89-year-old black guy who came to hear my presentation, and he remembers those signs. He had never seen anybody illustrate them since then. And he said they were all up and down the highway. And he, and he began to tell me about it. But he said he had never felt to take a picture. But this is the Kansas City Monarchs underneath the sign taking pictures, probably about 1945, taking pictures. They thought it was strange. Now, I'm speaking, I actually, tomorrow, I'll be throwing out the first pitch in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and guess what exit I'm going to get off? Part of the Bonita exit, right where this sign is. <laughs> hey, if you look at Tulsa, you can see Bonita on there a little bit. So that, I will be right there tomorrow, and when I go through there, I think about all the history that I know. And uh, so this is somebody on the bus. And of course, I'm almost finished now, but I have to mention Whipper Bullet Rogan. Whipper Bullet Rogan, in my opinion, is the greatest all-around baseball player that ever lived. Now, when I was growing up, when, it, when they talked about the all-around greatest player, that someone who could hit and pitch, who did they say it was? Somebody you know Babe Ruth? Babe Yeah. So how would Bullet Rogan compare with Babe Ruth? Well, as a starting pitcher, Bullet Rogan won over 400 games. Babe Ruth never won that many games as a pitcher. Babe Ruth did hit 714 major league home runs in the regular season. Babe, and I've been able to find only 400 that Billy Rogan hit. Babe Ruth was six foot two, Rogan was five foot seven and a half. But Rogan many times would pitch a shutout, hit a home run, and practically win his own baseball game. And how about this? He was a 10 second man, which means he could run the 100 yard dash in less than 10 seconds. Now, somebody knows Babe Ruth couldn't do that. <laughs> That's Wilbur Bullet Rogan, in my opinion, the greatest all around baseball player. And since Shiny, Shiny Otani, I don't know if you've got any baseball fans, plays right now, he's pitching and hitting home runs, um, came along. And uh, I've sold a whole lot of Rogan books now because people say, wait a minute, what about this guy? They're all of a sudden they're interested. So, hey, whatever happens in baseball is good for me. <laughs> And, and if Rogan, if all those things that make Rogan the greatest baseball player of all time, in my opinion, aren't enough, how about this? He also drove the bus. <laughs> That's Bill Rogan's a bus at him outside of the uh, stadium, Bricktown in Oklahoma City, where he was born. He was raised in my hometown, Kansas City, Kansas. That's Bill Rogan wearing a Giants uniform. Okay, and then of course you heard of this guy, John Buck O'Neill. My last book was about John Buck O'Neill, and I decided to do something different. My first book, believe it or not, came out 30, I gotta make it, okay, 31 years ago. And so I, I, last year I put out a book, and it was called John Buck O'Neill, The Rookie, His Words, His Voice. And I wanted to take advantage of technology. So if you can get my book, it has QR codes, and you can scan those QR codes, and you can hear Buck O'Neill talking with me from an interview in 1985. Technology is a wonderful thing. And that book, 
my first book, or my, it was actually my second book, it won a Casey Award as the best baseball book of the year, 1992. And this book won an award for the best local history in Jackson County, which is Kansas City, Missouri. So still out there. And of course, uh, you probably remember Buck O'Neill got into the Hall of Fame last year. Well, to get into the Hall of Fame, you have to get on the ballot. And so they selected 10 historians to put the ballot together. And I was quite honored to be one of those historians. So I can say I helped a little bit get, to get Buck O'Neill in the Hall of Fame and also John Bud Fowler. Bud Fowler uh, played for Topeka in 1886, I believe it was. And uh, he is the only ball player who actually lived in Cooperstown who is in the Major League Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And uh, so they, they took uh, Double Day Field, if you're, I don't know if anybody's been to Cooperstown, they had Double Day Field, they changed the name to Bud Fowler Park, and that was last year, so Bud Fowler, and so I was happy that two people that I helped to get on the ballot got in the Hall of Fame, and I hope they call me back. So that kind of concludes my uh, presentation today. I do want to end with a bit of poetry, but once again, I do want to thank you all for coming and taking some time to be with me today. A couple years ago, I did a 200 city tour and about wore me out. <laughs> but I had so much fun, guys, I'm thinking about doing it again if I find a sponsor. <laughs> so God has blessed me to have good health. I just turned uh, 66. I turned 67 this year. And um, it's, it's just been a wonderful ride and drove down today and went to the cemetery and those kind of things. So I'm going to end, and I'm going to end with a couple of names that I've used in my presentation with this poem called the stars that did not shine. It goes something like this. My name is Chester Brewer. My name is James Cooper Bell, but my age is way beyond. I spend my prime in baseball shoes when my sporting days are gone. Not I'm just one more forgotten face among the black faced teams. An old dark horse that came the course they called the Negro Leagues. And I worked the fields in Tennessee, but I dreamed of better days. So I left the plow, the picking bag, to join the homestead graves. And all summer long, we played the stop, then hit, I played the states, then hit it south for fall. Through rain and dust, we rode the bus so we could play baseball. And we played for love, and we played for pride, and we seldom made much more. The bread, the beans, the hotels broke, so the roads were crowds don't grow. The all night rise, the city side came with the life I chose, but we made do, and we came through, because darn it, we were pros. And we played in the shadow of the Bay Blue Garrick and the rest that stood behind that big league fence while they were called the best. But we played them well and we gave them hell with every hit and pitch. Then stayed behind that color line and watched those boys get rich. But did they see Josh Gibson swing or Satchel throw his stuff? Or can you imagine how bad it feels when your best is not good enough? When clouds roll in across the sky to hide the brightest moon, is then you'll find some stars don't shine. Some folks were born too soon. So God bless you, Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, and, and Hank Aaron and all the rest. You wore hard numbers on your back when you played big league ball. But every time you hit one out, slid or laid one down, you carried us from that old bus to the halls of Cooperstown. Now my name is John Buck O'Neill. My name is John Bud Fowler. But you might not remember that. I'm just one more along the score who played with ball and bat. But everyone, when you seek out heroes and you praise this great pastime, remember a few of those brown-faced pros, the stars that did not shine. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I'll entertain a few questions and, and then we'll be on our way. Be sure to take all those cookies because if you don't, sometimes they try to send them home with me. <laughs> so, have any questions here? You may have mentioned it earlier, but are you still living in Kansas City? I live in Belton, Missouri now. I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, went to Winder High School. And right now I'm living uh, close, you know, I'm living in Belton, and the most famous person in Belton came here with her hatchet. Her name was <laughs> Carrie Nation. She's buried right there in Belton, Missouri. Delta right now. Where did the Monarchs play in Kansas City? In Kansas City, excuse me, in Kansas City, they started in 19, up to 1922. They played at Association Park, which was at 20th 
and a hollow to right on Prospect. And then when they built Municipal Stadium, they moved over there. It was called Milbach Field. They started playing there in 1923. So all of their home games were played there. The same stadium that the athletics played in? Uh, yes, it would be. When the athletics came in the 1955 season, they put an upper deck on it. But they had, they had only a single deck, like a minor league ballpark uh, prior to that. And in 19, I write about this in my Dizzy Dean book, 1934, the Kansas City Monarchs only played four games in Kansas City. They played more games in Wichita that year than they played in Kansas City. How about that? Oh, yeah. Take one more, one or two more. Are we good? Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, it's been my honor. Thank you so much to Phil and to Humanities Kansas for sponsoring today. Um, I wanted to, real quick, by the way, my name is Kristen Martin. I'm the marketing director here. I had a few notes. Um, you may have noticed on your tables or on your chairs, there is uh, some of our upcoming talks. So our next talk is our Coffee with the Curator on Thursday, May 18th at 9 a.m. That one is also free. Uh, through Humanities Kansas that is called You Say Tomato, I Say Tomato, Evolution of Language by Mary Cohn. So that's May 18th, and then you can see the other two on here. Um, if you're not currently signed up, to, signed up to get emails about these events and you're interested in being emailed whenever we have a talk, uh, catch me and I'll, we can write it on my paper and I'll get you down for our emails. Um, finally, if you're interested in coming to more of these talks after May when um, the admission goes back to $4, we do have the membership brochures on the table. So if you get a membership with the Museum of World Treasures, you can come to all of our bi-monthly talks for free. Um, so if you enjoy these, that's a really good option for you. Um, so thank you again to Phil, and we will see you at the next talk.